Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, our next speaker is going to be shortly arriving on stage. So, after 10 years as a practicing attorney, our next contrib contributor was uniquely equipped to do what so many photojournalists attempt to do, except in her case, no fixers were required. Debbie Cornwall started out studying photography, graduated from Brown University and Harvard Law School, and spent a decade defending human rights cases. The professional skills Debbie acquired, exhaustively researching, coordinating, and preparing for the courtroom, she later applied directly to negotiations through US military protocols, to the heart of what she describes as invisible systems, official fictions, and hidden truths. Having gained access to those US military bases, constructed to resemble Afghan and Iraqi villages, she transformed what she saw into conceptual works, revealing ritualistic war games in a new light. To me, her work is like an invitation to a dinner party where some of the guests, though present at the table, do not speak. To tell us how she goes about her craft while still retaining a sense of humor, please welcome Debbie Cornwall. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to talk about my practice through my two books. And I'm going to start with a work on show here at the Exposure Festival. Welcome to Camp America inside Guantanamo Bay. And it starts on September 11th, 2001. When the World Trade Center was attacked, I was about to start my first job as a civil rights lawyer in an office eight blocks north. Over the next 12 years, I went on to represent innocent DNA exonerees, wrongly convicted men who'd been proven innocent and released in lawsuits that we filed to try to uh, identify and expose and fix systemic misconduct in law enforcement and policing across the United States. But meanwhile, our country was reacting to those attacks. We went to war in Afghanistan in October of 2001, and on January 11th, 2002, the first so-called War on Terror prison complex was opened at the U.S. Naval Station in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. American authorities considered it the least worst place to put Muslim men they accused of having taken up arms against the United States. Over the last 20 years, 780 Muslim men and boys have been held at Guantanamo Bay, otherwise known as Gitmo, the vast majority of them without charge or trial of any kind. As of today, 39 men remain held there, of whom 20 have been cleared for transfer if only a country can be found to accept them. 12 are in a military commission system, and seven are designated as forever prisoners who will never be charged, never be tried, and never be released. The United States has thrown out the rule of law due to its fear. So when I stepped away from my career as a lawyer, I thought I would like to document, make portraits with men cleared and released from Guantanamo. At this point in 2014, there were hundreds of them. But I got nowhere the first time I tried. Who was I at that point? I was a lawyer who liked to take pictures. So I thought, why don't I try to figure out how to get to Guantanamo Bay? I did some research, and I found out who to ask for permission. I wrote a very vague proposal, took a ridiculous selfie for my bio photo I didn't know yet. And ultimately, I was given permission nine months 
and a background check later. And with permission comes 12 pages of rules of what you may not do. You may not photograph certain sections of coastline, no locking mechanisms, no surveillance mechanisms, and most importantly for my purposes, you may not photograph anyone's face. Even partial profiles will be deleted in daily operational security review. You're accompanied at all times by a military escort when carrying a camera, and you gotta follow the rules or there will be consequences. So the official permission came and I was off. My challenge was to take a different kind of picture because by 2014, we had seen the same image over and over and over again. If I ask you to close your eyes and imagine Guantanamo Bay, picture it in your mind's eye for a moment. I'm guessing the picture in your head looks something like this, right? Um, some version of orange jumpsuit, barbed wire, soldiers in fatigues. With that repetition, we don't look anymore, right? We don't think about what it means. We've decided what we think, if we have an opinion at all. Either we think these are terrorists, or we think this is a gross violation of human rights, but I don't need to do any more work, right? So I wanted to take a different kind of picture, which is a challenge under these circumstances. So when I arrived for the first of three visits and I, I got to the airport there on the lower left, you can see the landing strip, and I was on the ferry across from the leeward side to the windward side with the first of a string of military escorts, I got very lucky. My military escort said to me, Gitmo's the best posting a soldier could have. There's so much fun to be had here. Which took me aback. But then I realized I hadn't seen the fun of Guantanamo. Maybe that's the different kind of photograph. Show me that. I will look at what you want me to see. So, in addition to the official media tour stops, I went to the Marblehead Lanes, the fun for those posted as soldiers and guards. Uh, the Tiki Bar, just outside the officer's uh, club. the outdoor movie theater called the Downtown Lyceum, where you can see first-run movies like American Sniper for free, if you have freedom of movement, that is. Soldier lounging on Windmill Beach, and you see a bit of rock off on the horizon on the left side of the image. Up to the side, off screen, is a cliff atop of which are sitting the detention centers, the prisons that I was not allowed to photograph. So I documented the fun, which came in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Turns out there's a gift shop at the US Naval Station in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, which was unremarkable to me as an American until I left and came back and realized, what are we doing? I need to document this. So I bought the toddler t-shirt for $6.99. I bought the turkey vulture for $12.99. The Fidel bobblehead sold by the gift shop at Radio Gitmo with the tagline, Rockin' in Fidel's Backyard goes for $20, or it did when I was there. Um, it's now up to $40 as a collector's item. What could be more American if we can package it and buy it and sell it and consume it? On some level, that's how we can understand the world. It felt important to me uh, to address this layer of the commodification of American military power at Guantanamo Bay. And you were promised a sense of humor, so I suppose here it is. This is my favorite among these objects. 
uh, the play on words, it don't get mo better than this, which is yours for free with the purchase of a purple teddy bear for $11.99. In doing research about this work, I came across a quote from 2004 from a political operative in uh, the Bush administration in 2004, who told a New York Times reporter about the United States, we're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. A democracy is meant to represent the will of the people, but this struck me as an incredibly candid thing to say, an incredibly honest thing about how power operates. And I realized that is what interests me in making photographs, is I wanna look at state-created realities. So it's one thing to document the fun show, but I wanna convey it as a show, not as truth. So I wanna put it in context the seaside galley celebrating Guantanamo as uh, a tropical offshore prison paradise, coupled with the equivalent space for the inmates. This was introduced to me on the right as a chair for the enteral feeding of detainees on long-term non-religious fasts. It's a feeding chair for prisoners who are hunger striking against the conditions of their confinement. Language is power. The kiddie pool for the children of high level officials and civilians uh, to play in under the hot Cuban sun. And a compliant detainee media room in Camp 5, which was the solitary confinement unit. This was part of the official media tour, and it was available for inmates in solitary confinement if they followed the rules and the orders of the guards. They might have been given the privilege of watching a censor-approved movie or DVD, sitting in the chair with one leg shackled to the floor while being surveilled, being watched through the double-sided mirror. Here's the fun show. This is another image from the official media tour presented as comfort items made available to inmates based on their level of compliance. So on the bottom level, we were told, is the basics. Everybody gets access to what's on the bottom. Flip-flops, toothpaste, a uniform. Compliant detainees are rewarded I was told, with a cushion to sleep on, with towels, a change of clothes, perhaps. How to put this in context as part of a show? Well, as I will get to in a moment, ultimately I did have an opportunity to meet a number of men who had personal experiences in those cells. And when I met Jamel in Algeria, I brought him some of the prints I had made of the images at Guantanamo and invited him to intervene. And he annotated based on his own experience. We're out of pillows, he was told. Why didn't I ever get the large tube of toothpaste? Or we don't have that in your size. Or ask your interrogator for a pillow. If you are familiar with what we, we as Americans have done at Guantanamo Bay, you might see this image and think, oh, that's where inmates were tortured with loud music. It's not, actually. It's the Liberty Center band room where off-duty Marines can rock out with drums and guitars. But it, it could pass as a torture chamber, juxtaposed with a recreation pen in Camp Echo. And what I met survivors of Guantanamo Bay uh, following my visits there. Uh, I met one man in particular, Mozambique, who wrote an essay for my book about his experience in that pen. He said, it opened up worlds of opportunity for me. I had so many choices. I could walk or I could run. I could go 
clockwise or counterclockwise. Or if I was feeling particularly perky, I could try to climb the chain link fence and peek at the ocean, which otherwise I could only hear and sometimes smell. But he said it was so painful. Many of these images are hand-developed, medium format film, which I negotiated permission uh, on the condition that I carry in dry chemicals on the charter flight, set up a mobile darkroom in my hotel bathtub, and process the film in the presence of my military escorts which didn't seem like a most efficient use of their time, but was important. Um, then I had to hang up the film to dry overnight, uh, scan it with a scanner I shipped down for this purpose so that they could do the digital operational security review and clear each image for me to take with me. What I experienced under these circumstances where the frame after this one was deleted because one of the soldiers turned toward me and you could make out his profile. The rule was if your mother can recognize you, it gets deleted. It really brought home to me the denial of personhood in this place. And I carried that with me as I moved on from documenting Gitmo at home, Gitmo at play, back to my original idea, which was to collaborate with the global diaspora of men cleared and released from Guantanamo around the world. There are now 59 countries who have accepted men. Uh, some of the men returned home, but others were not allowed, or it wasn't safe for them to return home. So third countries have accepted them. How to convey visually what a disorienting experience this must be for these men? I thought that I understood it, because what they are going through is very similar to what my former clients go through within the United States, except my former clients have been proven innocent. They have court documents, they have DNA tests, making it official. Men cleared and released from Guantanamo have no such evidence. They remain suspects forever. So how to convey that that inner trauma persists long after the body is freed? I photograph them as though they were still held in Guantanamo and subject to the military's no faces rule. So this is Jamel, a Berber in Algeria, uh, who returned home after being held for 11 years, 11 months, and 18 days in Guantanamo without charge or trial. And 48 hours before I was to fly to work with him, I got an email. And he said, hi, Debbie. Um, I know we had arranged to meet, but I, I, I'm crashing and I'm avoiding my family right now, and I'm, I'm so sorry, but have a good trip to Algeria. And I thought about it, and I realized I would never meet him if I didn't go. And I sent him an email back, and I said, I'm so sorry you're going through this. You're not alone, given what you've been through. But I know you learned to paint when you were in Guantanamo, and I'd like to bring you some paint and brushes and paper, and if nothing else, I'd like for you to have these things. And so I flew, and he agreed to meet with me and accept small gifts, and we were just present together. I didn't ask him questions. We just connected as humans. And eventually he said, okay, let's make some pictures, and ultimately invited me to his home outside of Algiers, where a year and a half after his release from Guantanamo, he was still wearing the same prison-issued shoes, sleeping on a mattress on a floor in his brother's home, catching occasional work as an electrician. He couldn't get a full-time job. So I went around the world, ultimately photographing 14 men living in nine countries. 
And for men like Morat in Germany who'd returned home, we found locations relevant to their lives. So he was a refugee counselor, and we found this refugee housing unit in um, Bremen, where he lives, um, which happened to have architecture very similar to the container architecture at Guantanamo Bay. Samuel Hajj, Sudanese cameraman arrested covering the war, crossing the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, ultimately released and, along with his family, given full citizenship in Qatar. He's been given a raise, is no longer a cameraman, but is running a rights and liberties division there. So I photographed him behind the desk. Mamdou returned back to his hometown in Egypt. Each of these men is facing an array of restrictions on his liberty, though they were cleared and released. And it's arbitrary. Um, it often depends on secret agreements between countries. So he's one of the very few men who has been compensated. Australia compensated him for its complicity in his rendition to Egypt, where he was tortured before being sent to Guantanamo. But at every international border, he is stopped and interrogated. For men like this Chinese Uyghur who chose to remain anonymous after being sent to Albania, we chose locations to emphasize the disorientation of being sort of dropped on the moon to left to your own devices, to learn a new language, a new culture, um, form a community. Hamsa, a Tunisian sent to Slovakia after almost 13 years without charge or trial, is one of the only two Muslims for hundreds of miles, and he is followed by the secret police. He is harassed by his neighbors. Two weeks before I arrived, special forces operatives broke down his door and shot him with rubber bullets. And he kept the door off its hinges. He kept the destruction because the American witness was coming. And I said, why did they do this to you, Hamza? And he said, I asked them. And they said, well, you didn't leave your home in three days. And he handed me a sheaf of papers and he says, look, I can prove I left home during those three days. Do you think the FBI will help me? He's living in the small town in Slovakia along with Hussein, who is a Yemeni. There are no mosques. He's at prayer outside. When I present the work in book form, I want to find ways to engage readers. Uh, with grappling with some of these questions, these many different layers. Um, so one of the things um, that I've done is include leaked and declassified documents on the bureaucratization of violence at Guantanamo, the legal memoranda, the interrogation tactics, redacted with black boxes. Each of the portraits of the 14 released men is in a folio the whole book is Arabic and English to be in conversation with this, those most impacted. And when my book designer, David Chickie, first suggested this idea, I said, that's crazy. You can't have pieces of paper falling out. And then in the next moment, I realized that's brilliant. It's conceptually exactly the arbitrariness that these men have gone through, being arbitrarily taken out of their lives and reinserted back in though they had done nothing wrong. With the official documents, um, each of them is folded over. So when you come to it, you see that there is something official covered over. If you choose not to look, that's fine, but you're aware that you made a choice not to. If you decide, I wanna see what's under there, you take an affirmative act to open the page, and it's a full eight and a half by 11 letter size. So that's Welcome to Camp America. My next book uh, is Necessary Fictions. And it really grew directly out of my experience at Guantanamo, where I spent 
long days with my military escorts, learning about their lived experience. All of them had served uh, abroad. And one thing I realized in then meeting the men cleared and released from Guantanamo is they had something in common with their guards, which was nobody was sleeping through the night. I became interested in the experience of waging war, the human experience for those who fight and civilians impacted, and how one prepares for the harsh reality of killing or being killed. So I traveled quite a bit in exploring these questions about what at that time were ongoing wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, looking at the devastation wrought, wondering how it felt for those on both sides. But I never left the United States. I photographed on military bases across the United States where mock villages had been constructed for immersive, realistic military training scenarios, hosting soldiers who are preparing to deploy, to get on airplanes abroad. These stage sets often in the American West, in the deserts, um, I, I think I photographed in 10 different sites, often in Texas, predominantly in California, uh, were erected to give soldiers the experience of what they might see and hear and even smell when they arrived in foreign countries. But as you can see from this intra-denominational house of worship, things were a little off. This one has a cross <clears throat> alongside its minaret. The idea was to have fidelity, physical fidelity, to what soldiers might find, and to create the sounds of war, um, to inoculate soldiers, to guard against the trauma of war. It'll be muscle memory by the time they arrive. So they don't have to think about what they've learned. But again, things are a little off. And it was these slippages between the reality and the fiction that came to interest me. The mock village sites were not empty. They were populated by cultural role players, civilian Afghans and Iraqis, many of whom have fled war only to recreate it in costume in the service of the US military. They enacted scenarios in which they played versions of their past selves. Maybe they played a village elder or a shopkeeper. Or even a suicide bomber. I asked them, why do you do this work? It must be hard to listen to the gunshots and the explosions. And I was told, we are Americans now. We are trying to give back. Is there something about the fiction that makes it easier to see the truth? Can these fictions illuminate some underlying reality? In addition to photographing the scenarios and the role players, I also uh, documented the soldiers themselves who were uh, going through the training. And they were not only the aggressors in these scenarios. War means injury, war means death. And there are so many powerful images on display here at the festival documenting those realities. I documented real American soldiers who were dressed by Hollywood makeup artists between movie gigs as though the soldiers were mortally wounded. I had maybe five minutes with each of them between the makeup 
and going out into the field for their triage scenarios. And some of them said, I would like to enact how it might feel if I were injured this way. They really wanted to think about what it might look like for them. And that was the same question I asked of each person that I photographed. How does it feel to be made up this way, knowing that you are going to deploy? One young man I spoke to didn't answer for several minutes, which is a long time when you're sitting in a mobile portrait studio. And I kept clicking the shutter. And finally, he turned and he said to me, I just got married. In publishing uh, my book, I made several visits out to Santa Fe where my publisher sits. And I realized these images could be um, really charged for an American audience. So I wanted to assess how they might read. And so I stopped in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport and I summoned up the courage. The first person I went up to was um, an older gentleman with a gray ponytail and a Veterans for Trump t-shirt. And when we got off the plane, I introduced myself and went up to him and said, if you have a moment, I'm, I, I'm an American photographer and I'm, I'm making pictures of American soldiers. And I wonder if you might have a quick look and tell me what, if anything, comes up for you. And you know what he said to me? I see the horrors of war. And he went on to tell me about his service. For some of the soldiers, it's a joke. Maybe that's the sane reaction to distance from the reality. But a number of the people I met in the airport who looked at these images echoed that first man. Some said, oh, that's fake, and, and sent the pictures back to me. But others said, this is what we don't see. And they became emotional. I think some of us may be primed to use fictions as a portal into questioning realities. And that's really what my practice is about. Uh, it's, it's, I don't have the answers necessarily. I have a lot of questions. And I wanna look at fictions as a way to illuminate our human condition um, and grapple with these questions. And I invite you to join me in grappling with them. Thank you.